And as the kind of organizer and genius behind all of this, uh, Hardy Merriman kind of has taken the lead and worked with um, some of our team to put this together. So I want to introduce Hardy, turn things over to him to do a welcome on behalf of Civic, and then also to um, introduce our panelists and our, our topics for today. So Hardy, all over to you. Great, thank you so much, Wes. And thank you to, to your colleagues at ASIL. We're really excited to be coordinating with you and collaborating on this event series. Um, again, my name is Hardy Merriman. I'm president uh, and CEO of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. And uh, our work focuses on nonviolent civil resistance movements around the world uh, that are fighting for rights, freedom, and justice. So um, as, as Wes mentioned, this is a three event series and um, <clears throat> it couldn't come at a better time. Uh, the international legal community and the civil resistance community both have a lot of things in common. They're, intra they're concerned with human rights, they're concerned with reduction of violence, they're concerned with self-determination, and yet the civil resistance and international legal communities have not had a lot of bridge building and intersection. Uh, they both have specialized languages and definitions um, and some differences in, in the approaches they take with international uh, <clears throat> law focused more on institutions and institutional processes and civil resistance focused more on processes outside of institutions and social and political organizing. And yet we have so much in common in terms of what we care about and are concerned about. And so it's really poignant and great to be able to bring together three events um, to try to cross pollinate our disciplines. And I'll just describe the three events very briefly. Today's event is gonna draw on cutting edge scholarship on the pra and uh, practitioner knowledge of civil resistance. We're gonna focus on what activists on the ground are saying they need, uh, what new research tells us about this phenomenon, and what new research tells us about this phenomenon um, so that those in the international legal community have more orientation and can grapple with the implications of new research and practitioner experiences and what that means for international law. Um, then as Wes mentioned in two weeks, because we're gonna skip next week, two weeks, two Wednesdays from now, um, our second event will focus on actually looking at civil resistance movements and how they contribute to international law. How international law might increasingly come to recognize popular people's movements as sources of law, as lawmakers, particularly in the area of human rights. And then in three weeks, uh, our, our last event in this series on February 3rd, um, is going to focus on the question of external support to nonviolent movements that are struggling for human rights and democracy around the world. Evaluating what forms of support are effective, what forms of external support are effective, and also what forms of support are permissible under international law, uh, depending on the circumstances. So today, uh, to dive into this event, I wanna introduce um, our panel, uh, which we're really excited to have uh, such an outstanding group with us. And so I'll start with J Dr. Jonathan Pinckney, uh, who's a senior researcher um, for the Nonviolent Action Program at USIP and has published a number of really um, excellent works on civil resistance, democratization, and so forth. Um, and so we're excited to hear from Jonathan. We also have Alba Peroy, peace builder and social activist from Venezuela, who has years of experience, um, <clears throat> years of experience uh, in peace building and civil resistance. Uh, we had a late substitution. Zahra Haydar could not afford, could not come uh, due to unexpected circumstances, and we're really thrilled that Kuskondi Abdul Shafi could uh, could speak to us about Sudan. He is the regional advisor uh, of Sudan for Freedom House, and also a great activist and organizer in his own right. And just joining us, we're thrilled to have uh, Franak Viajorka, uh, advisor to Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana uh, Tsikhanouskaya, uh, a journalist and activist and organizer. Uh, really so thrilled to have you all here. Thank you. Um, and what I will do, I will, I will give each of you a fuller introduction right before you speak. So right now I'll give Jonathan a little bit more of a fuller introduction. He'll speak and then we'll go to Alba, Kaskondi, and then Franak and then go to Q&A. So a little bit more about Jonathan and perhaps if we're not speaking, um, people could turn off their cameras, I think. Um, that would be good. Um, so Jonathan Pinckney is a senior researcher for the Program of Nonviolent Action at USIP, United States Institute of Peace, where he conducts applied research on civil resistance, peace building, and democratization. He's the author of the book, From Dissent to Democracy, The Promise and Peril of Civil Resistance Transitions, which is from Oxford University Press, as well as two monographs through my organization, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and as well as numerous academic and popular articles. So Jonathan, please take it away. Talk to us a bit about uh, the field of civil resistance, uh, your research, and what you think people need to know as top line findings. Thank you. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Hardy, and thanks to ICNC and to ASIL for the invitation to join you at this event. Uh, so as Hardy mentioned uh, in my remarks, uh, I want to provide some context for some of the main research findings on civil resistance, its effectiveness, uh, and its long-term impact, uh, particularly on democratization, which is an area where my research has particularly focused. So first, I think it's important to clearly define what I and other scholars like me who study civil resistance mean by that term, as well as closely related terms such as nonviolent action or nonviolent resistance, which we tend to use interchangeably. While many of you likely have some kind of mental model that comes to mind uh, when someone uses those terms, uh, say Mahatma Gandhi or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the terms themselves are, are frequently misunderstood. So following many of the definitions from the academic literature, I define civil resistance as the application of political force outside the normal avenues of politics and without the use or threat of physical violence. Now, so this definition has three core components, uh, each of which bears some elaboration. Uh, the first is that civil resistance is the application of political force. It's a technique for engaging in struggle, not something that is identical with any one ideology, type of actor, or goal. Uh, through actions such as protests, strikes, boycotts, or others, practitioners of civil resistance apply pressure to and seek to disrupt existing power structures and achieve their goals. And the second component is that civil resistance takes place outside of the normal avenues of politics. It involves tactics that don't fit into existing political institutions, typically because those who employ it don't have access to traditional avenues of political influence. Though often, organizations or movements that use civil resistance also seek to use institutional avenues uh, to advance their goals. So one can think about the activities of, say, the civil rights movement in the United States, who engaged in advocacy through the courts and through legislatures, but also used sit-ins, boycotts, and other tactics that weren't part of the existing institutional avenues. And third, of course, civil resistance does not involve the use or the threat of physical violence. Uh, its ability to affect change comes through disrupting power structures, not through threatening harm to its opponents. It's important to note as well the things that civil resistance is not. Uh, civil resistance is not just about making requests uh, or expressing dissent, but about pressuring opponents to grant demands. And while street protests are a common tactic and perhaps the, the thing that most people think of uh, when they think of civil resistance or nonviolent resistance, civil resistance is not just about protesting in the streets, but involves a whole range of different ways of applying political force. Uh, nor is it necessarily connected to pacifism or any particular ideological position on violence. Um, as the scholar and activist George Lakey has observed, most people, who, uh, many, most people who have practiced civil resistance have not been pacifists, and most pacifists never practice civil resistance. Now, while civil resistance typically receives less attention than war and other forms of political violence, civil resistance campaigns have been a major force for change throughout history with documented examples going back uh, at least as far as ancient Egypt and Rome. Uh, in the modern era, there have been thousands of documented campaigns of civil resistance for a wide variety of goals, including hundreds that have directly confronted dictatorships to demand fundamental political transformation. And this historical record, as well as a growing research field, indicates that civil resistance is a disproportionately powerful means of achieving those fundamental political changes. For instance, uh, in their groundbreaking book, Why Civil Resistance Works, political scientists Erica Chenoweth and Maria Steffen find that civil resistance campaigns from 1900 to 2006 for the most difficult goals, regime change, secession, or ending a military occupation, succeeded roughly 50% of the time. In contrast, violent campaigns for similar goals only succeeded around 25% of the time. And this uh, advantage of success holds even in situations of violent repression uh, and in closed autocratic political systems. Uh, civil resistance can succeed uh, even in conditions that are extremely difficult. Now there are many factors behind this superior success rate, but one of the most consistently identified of these factors, uh, both in Chenoweth and Stefan's work and in numerous other studies, is civil resistance campaign's superior ability to generate widespread diverse participation throughout all sectors of society. 
This participation in turn then leads to a superior ability to undermine the institutional structures that support opponents and lead to change. Now, success, of course, is certainly not guaranteed for civil resistance campaigns. As I mentioned above, uh, raf roughly half of campaigns fail and long-term political transformation, even after short-term success, is another major challenge. Yet on the long-term side, there are also some reasons for optimism. There's an increasingly robust finding that civil resistance not only succeeds at higher rates than violence, but also leads to greater democratization than any other means of bringing about political change, in particular relative to violence. And this finding has been replicated many different times in many different studies. Uh, research in why civil resistance works that I mentioned before finds that countries that experience a nonviolent resistance campaign have roughly a 57% probability of being a democracy five years after the campaign ends, while countries that experience a violent resistance campaign have only a 6% probability of being a democracy. In my own book, From Descent to Democracy, I find that political transitions initiated by nonviolent resistance end in democracy around 80% of the time, while political transitions initiated by all other means end in democracy only around 30% of the time. And these striking relationships hold constant when statistically controlling for alternate explanations, such as the country's prior level of democracy or level of economic development. So civil resistance appears to have a striking positive effect on democratization. So why does this occur? Well, when you examine the political transitions that tend to follow successful civil resistance campaigns, you see strikingly different patterns of political behavior than in transitions that have been brought about through other means, such as violent insurrection, external intervention, uh, or top-down reforms. The leaders brought into power through civil resistance tend to have more democratic preferences, the norms of political conflict tend to focus more on peaceful dispute resolution. And perhaps most critically, there's often a diffusion of power from elite centers to the grassroots. Having achieved a breakthrough via grassroots political action, people tend to be more empowered to continue to push for change. This combination of factors makes civil resistance transitions much more likely to lead to democracy. However, uh, it's important to note that this doesn't always happen. Uh, while civil resistance provides a significant advantage for democratization, its democratizing effect isn't universal or automatic. Instead, it depends on the political choices made by activists, political leaders, and ordinary people during the transition period. And I found that two challenges in, in particular during transitions make a significant difference in whether civil resistance leads to democracy. First is the challenge of maintaining mobilization carrying forward the momentum of civil resistance against an old regime into civic engagement for long-term democratic change. And the second is the challenge of directing that mobilization away from revolutionary goals towards building and supporting new political institutions. If both these challenges can be successfully resolved, then a transition to democracy is highly likely, while if either fails to be resolved, then a return to authoritarianism is more likely. So uh, to wrap up my opening remarks, civil resistance, the extra institutional nonviolent application of political force is frequently understood, misunderstood, but nonetheless widespread powerful force for positive political change. It comes with its own dynamics and challenges, but has been a strikingly successful force in pushing for major political transformation. In particular, civil resistance has a well-documented positive impact on democratization, something that is all the more crucial in an era when democracy in the, around the world uh, is in decline. So once again, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to join you today, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you so much for that really rich synopsis of a number of top line research findings. Uh, that, was, that was really gave us a lot to think about and a really, really great start. Um, to move to move forward. And so I want to now uh, invite Alba Peroy uh, to speak. And Alba is a peace builder and social activist born in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, she's part of the network of Latin American trainers uh, of nonviolent of, in the nonviolent action program of the United States Institute of Peace uh, for Colombia, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Um, <clears throat> she develops working on the synergy between nonviolent action and peace building in the region. Um, currently, Elvis focuses on supporting uh, the strengthening of Venezuelan grassroots women as peacemakers. Alba, thank you again, and uh, look forward to hearing your, th your thoughts. 
Thank you, Harley. <clears throat> uh, well, first, I would like to thank the International Center of Nonviolent Conflict and the American Society of International Law for this wonderful invitation. Uh, for me, it's not only a pleasure, it's a commitment to be here as a social activist and in touch with all of you, with this audience and other colleagues to exchange experiences and learn from them. And well, first I have to say, after this wonderful uh, presentation from Jonathan, I would like to, to start my, my, my presentation saying something about the, the, the current context in Venezuela in order to put in, in, in our experience uh, around the, the who has been the, the civil resistance moment, movement in Venezuela. It has had uh, different uh, periods, ups and downs. Um, perhaps, as you may know uh, through the, the, the um, presentation from Jonathan, civil resistance is definitely uh, a, long, a long way to, to achieve uh, goals. So for us in Venezuela, uh, build or rebuild a civil resistance movement now is really a harder challenge. Uh, because um, as a country, we are now in a complex situation uh, about talking about humanitarian crisis. So if I have to draw a framework now from the last two years, because I want to refer to the last two years in Venezuela, I must focus uh, in, the, in the following points. Uh, and I want to, to put in context, in a political context now, just few few details around this. In January 2019, uh, Juan Guaidó, as a parliament president, assumed as a Venezuela interim president role and committed to a struggle for free and fair elections. Since that, over 50 countries recognized him as an interim president of Venezuela because the presidential elections uh, in 2018 where Nicolás Maduro was reelected were free and fair. So in 2019, we had two parliaments, one legitimate elected in 2015, and another designed by the court and President Maduro for constitutional purposes. At that time, we had two presidents and two courts also, one court at Silet and one working in Venezuela. It sounds really weird, but it is the, the situation. That's why I wanted to put in context all the audience about this. In last December, December 2020, we had parliament election, I mean the constitutional parliament elections. And the majority of the position decided not to assist because it will be an event with lack of transparency and without electoral condition, conditions. So this January, um, in Venezuela, we had all, again, two parliaments, one elected in 2015, uh, which declared this January, uh, January 5th, being in an administrative continuity and another elected last December. So we have again, two parliaments working. Uh, it is changing, I mean, this situation is changing our framework because perhaps many of those countries I mentioned before, which supported the, the uh, Guaidó's role in 2019, won't recognize him as an interim president from now on because he's not more parliament president. Well, in parallel, there is a complex social situation happening in the country, because even when the humanitarian emergency in Venezuela exists since 2015, in 2019 uh, has been officially declared being Venezuela, uh, being uh, was declared in a complex humanitarian crisis by United Nations. It is reflected among other factors by a collapsed health system, 17% uh, severe children malnutrition under five years old, 30% of population is on unsafe con nutritional condition, and we have one of the biggest migration all over the world. Uh, we had around 4.5 million, 4 million people who has left the country. 
for those reasons today, as a Venezuelan civil society, to reveal a strong social movement, I mean, to, to build a, a, a civil resistance movement, uh, we think that the struggle must be focused on advocacy human rights. I mean, must be focused on that uh, um, specifically. To keep the struggle only because the, the, the years before, keep the struggle only as a confrontation between two political sides in order to, to gain a, a feel in this, in this, this part is a zero-sum game which never will bring, will bring the most important resources to the table, which is the humanitarian crisis we are living. So instead of the confrontation rise up, the polarization and uh, uh, drives away its possibility to achieve an agreement in a pacific way. So people are suffering a devastating situation and surviving, and it's impossible to think strategically to change the political system. I'm talking that about 80% of the population are in this condition I mentioned before. So our job as a, as a social activist must be focused on train and organize people around the idea of a democratic national agreement now. The language or narrative to be based in terms of, uh, of a negotiation solution. Uh, which is a new challenge because most of the people do not believe in a Pacific solution right now because we have had different experiences before with really poor results. So finally, I want to summarize some key points for, for this audience and I would like to, to highlight what the needs we have right now as a social movement which is in uh, authoritarian conditions right now. I think we need to visualize the real situation locally and internationally. There is, for us, there is no freedom press. and Digital media are really threatened right now and journalists are persecuted. So right to free expression and right to be informed. Second, protection to our privacy, because human rights advocates are also persecuted. And defending our right is not a crime. And last, uh, I think technical support in terms of, I mean, learning from best practice in terms of conflict resolution, peace building, and new narrative, how to build new narrative around this, all these terms, all, all these topics. So this is my, my presentation. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Hardy. Great. Thank you so much, Alba, for um, for those comments in the background on Venezuela and you know looking at questions of sovereignty and recognition of governments and uh, the way in which movements can confer or convey sovereignty or not are all really challenging questions. Um, uh, but necessary ones really at the center of so many struggles against authoritarianism. Um, and when you come, when you add to that a humanitarian crisis uh, and, and a real parallel government that is trying to manage things, um, it really gives us a lot to think about and a need to, to, to push to think through what role international law and external groups can play in being supportive uh, and being supportive of, of self-determination self and human rights. And, and development. Um, great, thank you. And next we'll go to Kaskondi Abdul Shafi. He's our regional advisor for Freedom House's Africa program. Uh, he leads their Sudan projects supporting civil society uh, and rights groups to protect human rights and freedoms and promote good governance uh, and democracy in Sudan's transitional processes. Uh, Kaskondi has over a decade of experience uh, on youth nonviolent resistance, human rights, and democracy related to Sudan and East Africa. Holds a BA in development studies from Kampala International University and a dual MA in sustainable international development and conflict resolution and coexistence from Brandeis. Kaskondi, thank you. Thank you, Hardy, for kind introduction. And I also want to thank International Center on Nonviolent Conflict for organizing this meeting as well as the American Society for International Law. Um, I'm happy to join the team uh, on this discussion. 
and uh, great to hear from uh, the very promising data analysis from Janusson and also to hear from what's happening in Venezuela. So for me, um, I will basically uh, just give a brief on uh, how the international uh, law role could uh, promote or even hinder the movement, taking on the contextual example of what was transpired in Sudan from 2018, December 2018, until uh, uh, August 2019. Um, as you all know, the Sudanese uh, people have led a successful revolution uh, for over six months of nationwide movement, peaceful movement, uh, involving different uh, rise of youth uh, movements across the country that have been able to push a dictator who have ruled the Sudan for over for around 30 years to leave the power and successfully peacefully change the government uh, and 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 establish new government and I think uh, what we have learned is Sudan particularly in in learning about the nonviolent movement is a very good example because it is a country that has a violent movement in more three of its region and it has over 25 or 30 years of civil war, continuous civil war from different regions. And throughout these years, this, this, this was the third time where peaceful resistance have been able to change the regime and none of the regimes uh, dictatorship had been changed by the army movement. And this brings us to the question of what, uh, what could possibly be helpful for, 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 for the international part of it, particularly uh, in supporting the movement uh, and also being able to, to be kind of a proactive role player within the, the change process where popular movement uh, taking place. For Sudan context, mostly the movements of the nonviolent movement started for several times, including 2011, 2013, where the largest protest was happened. But the most critical point for the breakthrough and success is, is very uh, difficult and challenging, particularly with regard to the role of the international. And this comes to the question that we, I, I could say that, yes, the international law played a very strong role in ending several conflicts, particularly conflicts between the states. And, 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 and because it uses the institutions as Hardy mentioned it earlier in the discussion. And those institutions dealing with the sovereign as a sovereign state. Uh, and however, when uh, it assumes that the country has to be uh, 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 cohesive and the governments of those countries are representing everyone in the country. And that is critical because it's really not useful in resolving a conflict which happens internally within the country. And basically, when the nonviolent movement is parked across the country, the most ton strongest turning point is for the international to deal with the situation, they have to deal with the state as the institution. And that gives back the power to the few who have, have big arms and claim the sovereignty to use that sovereignty to help the revolution or to help the nonviolent movement and delay the change. And because of that, um, uh, for, for, for Sudan case, Several times the nonviolent movement was failed uh, because of the, 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 the inability to get support from, 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 from the international part of it, uh, despite the larger or wider uh, 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 rejection of the system, of the system and the, 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 the protest of the population and people's dream for, for the change. And I think that is uh, a critical point that might be several other uh, nonviolent movements might have gone through those critical points of getting, uh, reaching into the point where uh, uh, the major populations are turned into supporting the regime change 
but however the 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 who could be able to to to, to represent those people uh, or what kind of a mechanism could find for the for the international to give recognition of those entities or or those voices to claim the sovereignty and i think that is very 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 critical point and i and i believe that there should be some sort of rethinking how how the collaboration could happen the nonviolent international uh, nonviolent movement support either through skills or direct uh, kind of uh, supporting of the civil society could have another collaboration with an international frameworks where there should be some point which the international could be able to take a um, uh, uh, kind of a positive intervention, particularly the de-recognition of the sovereign claim of, uh, of few military force were being able to control the whole country. And I think that is not exist now at the current situation, which makes nonviolent movement very difficult to start, but also when it started and it sparked, it is very difficult to make a breakthrough because of those uh, kind of a challenge to make a transition to the second stage. However, it is uh, trying to see, for instance, when it is a violent movement, for instance, when it's armed movement, it is very easy and very fast, at least in the Sudan case, for, for, for armed movement to get a recognition, to get an international recognition, to have UN get in, to have uh, countries come in for peace negotiation and, 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 and get into uh, bringing kind of giving some kind of legitimacy and recognition uh, for, the, for, the, for the armed holders to be able to have negotiation. That is not a situation where within the, within the nonviolent movement. And this is reason because nonviolent movement basically is inside the country and it is within the government uh, uh, control. And because of that, more of the casualty that would happen within the nonviolent movement could be prevented if there is mechanism to, 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 for early intervention or mechanism to, to, to be able to lead those kind of trigger those negotiations on those mediation at early stage before things uh, deteriorate into uh, a dangerous uh, zone. For, 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 for another stage that I would be also be talking for, for instance, within the international support is mostly the nonviolent movement, particularly into, in the countries where uh, uh, there is very uh, uh, kind of a difficult kind of a different voices, particularly where there is a deep uh, horizontal or vertical social inequality uh, or deep intergenerational connection between young people and, 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 or, and elder people. And also where there is a systemic uh, kind of oppression against women. When the nonviolent movement succeeded, the critical point is that without a close support of how the things are being uh, visualized after the, the change, those voices completely diminish. It. And, 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 and because of that, for Sudan case, you would see what has happened after the regime change or after the negotiation that led to the new kind of arrangement, you will see the women voices that have been the lead into the, into the making the change itself have been uh, very minimum into, into what what's, uh, things look right now, as well as also the young population who have been the lead into the change process are not included into the institution that making the Sudan that they have been dreamed of. And this is because of the most of the support that comes in within the international, also support within the existing political framework. And this is just to stress the point that uh, supporting the, 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 the as, as, as Jonathan mentioned it, that there is a very much need, the success of any nonviolent movement is an ability to continue itself as a movement 
after the change, to be able to be stronger, to pursue the change even after the, 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 the new government was formed. The problem is that the mechanism and systems of international that might come in also, uh, uh, or, or come to support the negotiation use to deal with the existing political frameworks that are exist. The majority of the people who are kind of uh, frustrated and desperate and wanting to make this change, they don't have political uh, or institutional affiliation. And because of that, they are mostly excluded. So I think there is also need beyond the, the, the issue of uh, recognition or de-recognition of serving, the issue of how this support is being elevated to, for, for the change in the, in the critical moment. How to support movement, not just support the existing political institution, which is completely a different kind of a methodology. And still, I think that is a critical point within the Sudan context. That is the biggest issue that as a country so far is done. Though the movement is still alive, there is no stronger systemic support for those voices to be heard or for those who have different views of what kind of aspirations uh, that they want to see in their country to realize their dream. They don't have any sub systemic support for that. I will stop from that and get back to, to Hardy and uh, hear from other people. Thanks. Ms. Gandhi, thank you so much for that for that excellent background and synopsis. And the issues you raised, I hear um, I hear some common elements with what Alba said about uh, sovereignty, and it can be convenient and neat to say sovereignty resides in the government, um, but it's not actually helpful at times, or not doesn't actually reflect where sovereignty really is if people have moved on and want to shift. Also, raising questions of uh, what it means to recognize a nonviolent movement. Uh, what does it mean to give a nonviolent movement standing and international recognition as as a voice? Um, and questions also of incentives. If armed groups get recognized as being official and 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 having a seat at the table, and nonviolent movements do not, it can create incentives sometimes for armed groups versus nonviolent groups. So a lot there. Um, thank you again. And now um, I'd like to ask uh, Franak Vitorka to join us. Um, he is a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and a journalist from Belarus and an advisor to opposition leader Svetlana Sikhanovskaya. Uh, Franak is a frequent speaker and advocate for democracy and personal freedom. Uh, for his activism and journalism work in Belarus, he was jailed multiple times by the Belarusian government. Uh, he graduated with an MA from American University in Washington, DC and a BSA, BA from Warsaw University in Poland. Thank you very much. Uh, look forward to hearing you. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks uh, for the invitation. It's, it's a very great discussion. I'll try to give some uh, practical perspective on, on nonviolent uh, movement and resistance. Um, since my very uh, uh, childhood, I'm involved in the, in the uh, protests, in the resistance. First time I was jailed in, when I was 13 years old. Uh, with my colleagues from my high school, we organized some groups fighting for freedom and democracy. And uh, as many uh, of my peers, I was always thinking that uh, uh, the, the protest, the resistance, the underground uh, movement can be only, only peaceful. In Belarus, we have a dictatorship for 26 years. It's one of the last, the least free country in, in Europe and in the world. Right now, it's getting more and more totalitarian, uh, which is looking more as a military junta managed by uh, dictator Lukashenko, who doesn't want to uh, leave the, the post. Um, when, I was, when I was younger, we actually uh, had very limited arsenal of nonviolent resistance tools. We were using, of course, printed media. We were trying to do some uh, actions, rallies, protests, performances, flash mobs, everything that, uh, uh, keep that, that put pressure on the authorities. And, but, we, but with the time, we, we expanded our arsenal thanks to technologies. And right now, uh, Belarus um, nonviolent movement resistance is basically uh, technology empowered, it's technology based, it's internet based, and we manage somehow to, to build hybrid campaigns. Campaigns that include both uh, online pressure, uh, for example, name and shame campaign, uh, 
uh, discrediting uh, representatives of, of uh, uh, government uh, forces, uh, uh, identifying uh, Siloviki or police riot forces that are attacking protesters. Uh, we also do some, some electronic um, attacks on, on the website, cyber operations. We are trying to use messengers and um, uh, forms, popular social media, in order to mobilize people and to, to uh, um, discredit uh, the, 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 the government, uh, which is um, uh, compromised and corrupted. Um, right now, uh, we are at the stage of the popular uprising, where, uh, where we, we it's, it's not a stalemate, but this is a, the most decisive moment. Uh, five months ago, the uh, protest uh, sparked absolutely unexpectedly in Belarus, and it became uh, nationwide. Uh, we have 10 million population, and we can say that 2 million people involved in, in the resistance somehow. People began organizing the, the peaceful rallies, marching in their neighborhoods, putting, displaying uh, flags on their windows, their apartments, and of course organizing uh, uh, protests, mass protests in, in downtowns. Uh, this uh, movement uh, faced uh, very harsh, very tough reaction of the government. More than 32,000 were jailed. More than 1,000 are under criminal charges right now. Uh, eight people killed. Uh, more than 1,000 were tortured. Uh, many people lost limbs, uh, legs, eyes, and became handicapped for their for the entire lives. But this didn't stop people from resisting. This peaceful character, involvement of um, and new groups such as seniors, students, women made this uh, this movement very uh, self-sustainable, uh, organized, and and strong. But the biggest uh, reason, the the key uh, reason of the success of this of this protest of this revolution, is a grassroots uh, character. So our revolution is entirely leaderless. All all the leaders are in jail, uh, which which made uh, uh, people which forced people to organize themselves. Uh, regarding um, the, the uh, role of the international community, Belarus is quite isolated country, as you might uh, imagine, uh, but this time international solidarity played a key role. Uh, first of all, we, uh, me personally, my colleagues, we made sure that the all information was presented on, in English language about Belarus. Uh, we used uh, Twitter primarily and Telegram to spread the, the news from the ground. And what we did, we, we crowdsourced the videos and pictures made by people uh, on the ground, like police are beaten, like uh, people are kidnapped or tortured. We distributed and, and uh, subtitled these videos for international audiences. International reaction was um, very quick, thanks to, the, uh, to these visuals. And uh, we got very strong messages from celebrities, from digital influencers, like popular Hollywood actors, uh, uh, musicians, artists, but also politicians. And um, uh, in the moment when, when uh, uh, the movement became entirely leaderless, this international solidarity became the huge motivator for people to keep going. And this uh, constant repetition that you must keep going, that you must protest, that the whole world is with you and you have to be peaceful, it helped us to sustain sustain the protest. Uh, we uh, also um, realized that the movement must be supported, not just symbolically, but it seems um, that without technical assistance for media, for bloggers and for activists, it will not sustain. And uh, uh, technical assistance, usually it's, it's about uh, supporting with equipment, with uh, some small money, with some small, with, with uh, money for, for paper, for printing, for advertisement. And when we face the problem with uh, passing uh, the funds uh, to Belarus. Lukashenko, dictator, the first thing he has done, he closed the borders and he eliminated all the legal ways to bring money, to bring equipment to the country. And he switched off the internet entirely. And on one hand, we began looking for the circumvention tools. We contacted uh, Elon Musk, asking for providing Belarus. And Belarus is on, exactly on the on the, on the territory where the Starlink internet can, can be access, accessible in theory. We started to look for, for the opportunities to, to get internet without um, uh, during, during the blackout on one hand. On the other hand, we started using uh, digital currency. 
uh, almost 30% of the people uh, quickly switched from traditional banking financial system to digital currency, cryptocurrency as the way to, um, uh, to help each other, to uh, fundraise, to crowdsource, to help repressed families. And also uh, me, I'm, now we are based in, in, in Vilnius, it's a neighboring to Belarus country where the office of Tsikhanovsky is based. We use this as the way to digital currency, as the way to help people on the ground. And we face the huge bureaucracy uh, because traditional institutions, organizations and foundations that usually support media, let's say, or bloggers, they usually work in the traditional manner. You know, they need this bureaucracy, traditional way of supporting. And we live in the totalitarianism uh, where there is no traditional standard way, for example, to pass uh, uh, walkie-talkie to Belarus. And uh, we, had, we had the trouble to convince international organizations to deal differently with Belarus. We always repeat in that unconventional situation needs unconventional solutions. In Belarus, it's very unconventional situation. So you have to be same flexible if you want to help Belarusians. You have to change your rules. You have to change your standards if you want to really uh, change uh, this non If you want really to, to help our nonviolent uh, resistance. And then diaspora was the huge uh, helper here. Uh, we never expected such uh, power of diaspora. Uh, the Aspera, on one hand, was a very strong advocate in their countries, uh, putting pressure on the politicians to be more active uh, in helping Belarus. And on the other hand, the Aspera established direct connections to the vulnerable groups within the country. For example, the Aspera of New York, they help striking committee in Minsk. The Aspera in, uh, in Canada, they help student group in one university who are striking already for, for several weeks. So these this connections, uh, non-traditional connections helped a lot. And uh, basically that everything was made through the new emerging tools of communication like Telegram messaging app, which basically became the whole world, the, the, the major platform for uh, not just for communication, but, but, but for organization and societal mobilization. And thanks to, to owners of these platforms, and we were in touch with, uh, with the management of Facebook, of Instagram and Telegram, including. They helped us a lot to solve many issues in our movement. So, so this communication, not just with uh, foreign diasporas, foreign governments, but also with owners of popular platforms, which are major driver for nonviolent uh, uh, protest movements, resistance movements. Um, these contacts matter a lot. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Franak, for really sharing a, a rich amount of information on external support and how groups inside Belarus and just outside Belarus and in the diaspora are working together. Um, I have to say, following uh, the, the struggle in Belarus uh, with particularly the English language work you did on social media was enormously helpful for me in understanding um, and breaking down some of these attempts to crack down on the border, crack down on information. Um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, now I would like to ask all panelists to turn their uh, cameras back on. Um, we have a number of questions uh, that have popped up in the q and I have follow-up questions for all of you personally, uh, but why don't we take a few questions um, that people have typed in um, and then you know, some of them are specific, for example, to Alba or Kuskondi, but I'm also, after Alba or Kuskondi respond, I'm gonna, I want anyone to add if they wish. Um, we can start with this question uh, to Alba. Uh, would you consider the international recognition of Juan Guaido's interim government as a measure of support for the nonviolent resistance movement in Venezuela? What other measures should the international community have taken to support the nonviolent resistance movement in Venezuela? Thank you, Hardy. Well, um, re really, I, I don't think so. I mean, the, the, we need this recognition as a support of a, of a civil resistance movement. But what we really need is to make understand to the, com to the international community that for us, any particular solution, I mean, political solution, has to consider first the, the humanitarian crisis we are living now. 
that's why uh, I think we have changed the, the, the situation and how to manage this situation, even when we need uh, a political change in the country, because the last um, situation in the last two years has changed a lot. And, and what we see, uh, what we have seen is there is a huge, um, a huge uh, gap between the political leadership and the grassroots in the in the in the country, so uh, what we need now is to focus what uh, what the people is living now and what how to to sol to solve this, because if we don't focus on this, and I think in this sense, uh, international community ca can can help us a lot. And all of this country, which uh, in in what moment support the, the 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 interim president can support us in in order to to help us to uh, to to look for a negotiated uh, solution. And I think I can't um, connect this. Um, I mean, if you if you don't mind, hard to connect this uh, answer with the other question I have then, because um, uh, somebody asked me if, if, um, if it's challenging because most of the people today don't believe in a no violence solution in Venezuela. And I want to, to connect this with this because it's not that we don't believe in no violence solution. I think that the big challenge now is people do not think now in a, negotiated solution, which is part of a non-violent solution. I mean, non-violent solution can be, um, I mean, distributed in, 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 in both sides or can be watched in two, in two sides. That's why we, we talk about a synergy between uh, non-violent action and, and peace building solution or peace building tools to connect with this. And I think because we have had different times in the in the country about um negotiated solution and we have failed in this perhaps now people is uh, unsafe or, or untrustful on this on this uh, um, situation but i think of course uh, we need uh, or part of my work as uh, the question said uh, here uh, is to teach about this of course to train people about this uh, or most, more than to, to train or not only to train, is to, to inform and to explain what is the benefit to, to, to have a negotiated solution or, or to use, uh, I mean, peace, peace building tools like a dialogue, like a mediation, like a, like a, um, a negotiation in this context where we have 80% of the population in really uh, very bad conditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Alba. Um, let's see, great. So Alba answered two questions, which is excellent. Kaskondi, there are two questions I'm seeing for you as well. I'll read them both and perhaps you can answer them together. Uh, so even though they're different questions. So the first is what role do you attribute to the African Union's Peace and Security Council's suspension of Sudan on June 3rd, 2019, in the success of Sudan's nonviolent revolution. And the second question is, who represents the nonviolent movement in Sudan? Such movements are often described as acephalous, lacking a head and horizontal. Therefore, it's not clear whom outside actors should support if they are to support nonviolent movements. Kaskandi, enlighten us, please. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, for the question one, um, I, I should really stress that the decision of African Union Security Council to de-recognize uh, Sudan's uh, attempted military coup through the transitional uh, military council were, played a very crucial role into realizing the change. And uh, basically it did not protect the protesters, but it made very hard for the military whom actually sanctioned by the US and having other international UN related sanctions and regional isolation to be able to move forward 
with the recognition of the African Union. So they did not have any friend outside other than few friends, which is Saudi and Emirates. And it was difficult for them to move forward. And that is why they resorted to negotiation. And it's still today, uh, as the, the current transitional government is a very critical compromise with the military still having a lot of power to influence and is still having a lot of control through the, the, the 30 year built uh, state mechanism. The role of international, including the African Union Security Council throughout the transition in all phases until the election is really crucial. It remains as important as the day they took that decision. And that is why I think uh, 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 that is something that is very important to recognize, but it's not something that done for one time and over. It is something that's supposed to be continued until the free and fair election that there is a gov new government that comes that has a popular legitimacy to, to rule for a period of time. And I think that is something crucial to, to show. With regard to question two on the representation, I believe that uh, the one success of the nonviolent movement is because it is really, really a horizontal movement. And also, the, I, I understand nonviolent movement, it is an active citizen where every person has a responsibility, take a responsibility to take an action. And that responsibility is built on personal level, person or family to get out and go. With the Sidon case, all the people went into one place, they were sitting together, it's a new state. They have medical system, health system, they have the very well organized smaller Sudan that reflect all the diversities within the country. And I think when you say about the representation, the problem is that uh, for the people who want a regime change at immediate, and also they are putting their lives in an immediate danger, in attack at any time. They don't have time to think about how to institutionalize themselves. And that is something that we see, it's, it is a challenge. For instance, the Sudan movement wasn't built into unorganized organizations and political movement like movements before was having a big leader like MLK or Gandhi and people rally behind and they, no. This is mostly a digitally, built movement. And some people who are very friend and acting together from different city in different states, they have never met together. And because of that, I think that's where the transition process, understanding on who to get and who to support, uh, it might look very challenging for somebody who is from the outside. But actually within in the movements, these are very organized units. Each protest, you will see people going with the people they know, either through the neighborhood or either having a political organization or an organization that they trust together and they move together within even a larger protest. And that is where the homework is needed on being able to support the right groups, the people who are actually legitimate and genuine, uh, having a genuine representation. In Sudan case, there is this resistance committee, there is a professional, uh, Sudanese professional association, there's different groups. And I think where it's needed, you don't need to have one sovereign total person to say this is it. Having that mentality itself, it makes very difficult for any organization to support nonviolent movement if you want to have yeah, one very strong person, leader who will say yes, and everyone has to say no, and yes, then everyone has to agree, and I will support that. If you, we are waiting for that situation, is that is when we miss a chance to really be able to engage and support those voices being consolidated. Great, thank you so much, Kaskandi. And what I'm hearing, part of what I'm hearing is, if there's no clear external leader, no clear leader to people outside the country, that doesn't mean the movement is disorganized. And there are in fact many leaders in the movement. Um, great, excellent. And if we, if we have to wait for that one leader or you know, key group, then we, there are missed opportunities. 
Great, thank you. Uh, many more questions in the chat. There are more than we will have a chance to uh, respond to. So I welcome the panelists also typing in responses. But I uh, will take a, a couple for Franak and then a few for Jonathan. Um, so the first is, uh, does Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya intend to visit Washington in the near future? Uh, there was information in the press about her possible participation as a guest at inauguration on January 20th. I assume that will be a short, a short answer. Um, uh, so I, I'll, I'll add another question of my own at the end. Um, another question for Frenak is uh, the EU Commission announced uh, that it would provide the opposition in Belarus with 53 million euros. Has this money reached the opposition and how is it being used? And um, uh, the question I'll add, Frenak, is there has been criticism uh, of, of countries that support democracy uh, that they were not quicker to provide support in August of 2020 around the election, that they took their time, that they moved too slow and did too little initially. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well, if you agree with that and what you wish they had done, if in fact you there were things that you wish they had done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very difficult questions. Uh, first of all, Selena Tsikhanovskaya will definitely visit Washington DC. Uh, it was planned for so many weeks, but unfortunately inauguration will not uh, take place in the ordinary format. And there are no uh, foreign guests uh, invited for this inauguration this, this time. Uh, but Svetlana uh, got invitation from different uh, think tanks and from uh, subcommittees of, of foreign relations uh, in US Congress. Uh, the visit would happen perhaps in the end of February. And uh, this is very, very important for Belarus because still for Belarus and for the whole region, United States is like a center of, of political will. And when we speak about this uh, more uh, active involvement uh, and support of nonviolent non -violent movement in Belarus, United States were always the leader. And Belarusians perhaps overestimate the role and the power of the United States, but still I, I must say there is huge hope. And this, this was forever. And now with the new administration, this hopes just uh, uh, increased multiple times. Regarding second question on, on the uh, European aid, European Commission wanted to give 53 million to Belarus government. After the crackdown and so many people got killed, they say that this money perhaps will be reoriented to Belarus civil society. Uh, this money were divided. Uh, part of this money will be given to private businesses. Uh, part of them to the education programs, part of them to the civil society. In the end, there are no $53 million. In the end, the European bureaucracy consumed most of these uh, funds, divided them in the way, so they will not reach uh, people in, the, in Belarus. Unfortunately, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my introductory, introductory speech, for um, this um, big institution like European Union, it's much easier to work with traditional schemes. Uh, so they use traditional organizations. For them, it's much better to make this money working in the European universities, providing fellowships to Belarus students, than to arrange some, some scheme to help with this money people within Belarus. So people in Belarus, unfortunately, will not see. And the effect of this help is very limited. And uh, yes, this money were promised in the fall, but the real time frame is March 2021 when people will be already jailed, will get multiple year terms, the protest will be possibly have destroyed. So we see how slow bureaucratized the, the system is, and it's not built in the way to, to help democracy quickly. And I think it's not only Belarus case, it's everywhere. There is a will, but bureaucracy destroys any political will. Uh, and the last question was on, uh, Hardy, help me. Yes, it was, on, it was on August of 2020. Uh, what Did can they be come uh, too slow? Should they have done more? Absolutely. I think we lost the moment. Uh, you know, it's not only about Belarus. It happened in, in many countries. It was in Hong Kong. I think it was in Russian Khabarovsk. Uh, the West was watching and looking, okay, what's going on? You know, let's see, but let's not interfere. And uh, in Belarus case, Russia was always repeating, you shouldn't interfere, you know, it's internal uh, affair. Uh, and when they say don't interfere, they say we will be interfering and it's not your business. 
And unfortunately, the West used this as the pretext to not participate, to not help, to not get more actively involved. And when the process started, it was already too late because the momentum was in the August. In the August, we were very close you know, to, to abolish dictatorship. But when this international solidarity really came, it was already the moment when, when the system made the patchwork and stabilized more or less. And right now we are waiting for that second moment X when this critical moment will, will, will happen. Great, thank you, Franak. Um, and perhaps a final question uh, for Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, as, as a person on this panel who is part of an organization that, that is, would be external to many of these conflicts and seek to provide some form of support, whether it's direct or indirect. I wanted to ask you a bit to tell us uh, your experience and, and, US, and a bit about USIP's work, work externally, lessons learned, considerations, in terms of engaging with movements and trying to be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Hardy. That's a, uh, that's a great question. I think so the for the program on nonviolent action uh, we've been really interested in this question of how to most effectively come alongside uh, activists in a variety of different contexts that are engaged in in these kinds of struggles for for quite some time um, and uh, one of the first big projects that our, our program took on was a, a multi-year research project to really understand what were those sort of most effective modalities of external support uh, and the result of that research project that we've started to, to implement through our program is focusing really on, on two key things that were consistently uh, beneficial ways for external, that the, the research showed were consistently beneficial ways uh, for external actors uh, to engage with activists. Recognizing, of course, that not all movements are, are, are the same. Uh, movements have very different, uh, very different needs at different time, and even the same movement uh, may have uh, may have different needs at different times in its in its life cycle, um, and so what were sort of things that could be kind of consistently positive uh, sources of impact, and the two that that research project uh, really ended up centering on, and that our sort of engagement with activists has fo have focused on, uh, are training uh, as a, a first sort of key advantage in both in in nonviolent action, but also in skills like strategic planning. Um, and transition and uh, bringing together nonviolent action and peace building tools like dialogue or negotiation. Um, that these were these were typically tools that activists uh, told us during this research pro uh, pro project uh, that they that they could use they could use training in uh, across a wide variety of contexts. At least training is is one, uh, and then the second was providing convening spaces uh, for new activists and new movements. Uh, to meet with and learn from uh, experienced activists who had gone through sort of similar situations uh, to, to their own in the past. Um, and providing those really, you know, not kind of abstract academic lessons, but sort of directly, direct lessons from, from life experience uh, from, from activists who, who, knew, who knew what it was like to be uh, on the ground in the, in the middle of these kinds of situations. Um, I think, you know, there are, a number of other sort of challenges and lessons that we could go into, uh, but I think those are sort of two key avenues for for helpful external support that our research has uh, has found and that we've tried to focus on with uh, with our program. Great, thank you, thank you very much. And one one theme I've heard a little bit of is this capacity building and training. For Nock also talked about technical assistance, and this has come up as a theme in numerous other places. That if you can share knowledge, provide contacts. Uh, connect activists with each other and trust that they'll know what to do with that information and knowledge in those contexts, that that is something that tends to uh, to be uh, to be well received. Um, great. Well, thank you. And uh, we're, we're two minutes uh, short, short of the end. So I think we will close now. I want to uh, to thank again all of our panelists uh, for coming and sharing your time. Uh, and experience and insights. Uh, I, I sent an email to everyone before this saying, I wish we could hear each of you for an hour <laughs> at least, but um, we're really happy to have had you for the time that we have. Um, I also wanna thank ASIL, uh, the American Society of International Law, uh, for being a, a collaborative partner uh, in this series and uh, really hope and thank you also to all those participants who came and joined, asked questions and listened. Uh, we really look forward to 
our, our next event in two weeks uh, with Dr. Elizabeth Wilson and Dr. Todd and Todd Buchwald, as well as uh, in three weeks uh, with me, Maria Stefan, Tabitha Thompson, and uh, Farida Navarema. So thank you again very much uh, and have a good day.